All right. Good morning. Um, what do you guys think of this venue? It's a nice place. Um, I think it's great that they built this whole thing as a memorial to one person. Um, I bet George Washington was blown away the first time he saw it. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about Vertex today. And we're going to start with what Vertex is. Uh, it's a lightweight, high-performance application platform for the JVM. And I can also say a uh, human is something that walks on two legs and poops. So uh, just like the doc strings that you mentioned, they are accurate, but not very useful for understanding the essence and the true nature of the thing they're describing. So I want to take a different approach to talking about Vertex. And I wanna, uh, we're going to go look through some code that uses it and see how, how it actually does what it does. And we're also going to talk about some of the motivations, the problems it solves. So let's start with problems. The, these are the problems that Vertex uh, aims to solve. One is that uh, the JVM networking packages are Byzantine. And if you, don't, if you don't think they're Byzantine, you can at least maybe agree that they're inconsistent. Um, so it works on solving that problem. Uh, when you're building a, 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 a networking application, uh, you go down the road, if you want to be efficient, you go down the road doing things concurrently. And if you're using languages with mutable state, then you run into um, concurrency issues. Everything can't be asynchronous. So often, uh, when you're building a, an, an efficient network application, you go even further. You're not just concurrent, but you're doing things asynchronously. Um, and, um, but there are times when you have to be able to do things synchronously. And then tying together decoupled components can be painful, uh, especially if you're having to do it yourself, and especially if your uh, components are distributed across multiple JVMs. So how does Vertex attack these things? Uh, the first problem is it uses, it, it uses Netty. Netty itself is an, a wonderful abstraction over um, the networking packages that the JVM provides. And Netty is very powerful, but has a lot, of, um, a lot of knobs you can turn. So Vertex abstracts some of that away and simplifies uh, some of that complexity for you. Um, <clears throat> Vertex also guarantees that everything it does is thread confined. So if you're using a language, which is uh, we're mutable state, uh, we have mutable state, um, it's, it's, a, it's, either you're, it's less error prone to develop applications that way. Vertex is primarily an asynchronous framework, but it has synchronous facilities, so that when, at times when you have to do things synchronously, you can. And then for tying components together, uh, it provides a built-in distributed event bus that can actually sp span multiple JVMs to tie these things together for you. It's also polyglot, so it supports a lot of different uh, languages. The core um, distribution of Vertex basically supports Java and, and ships a, a bunch of Java APIs. And then for each of these languages listed, there's a, a module that then wraps that API in something that's hopefully idiomatic for that language community. And the ones marked with a star uh, just means they're not yet to a stable 1.0 status, and so they're not referenced as part of that core distribution. There's a configuration file in there that says uh, okay, you're deploying Ruby. I know what Ruby is. I'm going to go grab the module for that, install it, and run it. Enclosure's on there. That's why, that's what brought me here today. So I want to touch, I think a lot of us are familiar, uh, the advantages of async, but I want to touch on that just briefly, why we often end up in this uh, async place to trying, trying to build a performant network app. And the real reason is, is uh, um, instead of waiting for resources to become available, uh, you, you, you basically, you you get in a situation where you don't want your threads standing around, right, and waiting for a particular resource. So uh, instead, of, instead of waiting on that resource to become available, they go off and do other work. They register interest in some way in that resource, go off and do other work, get notified, uh, or able to resume work on that resource when it becomes available. Um, the, the model that Vertex uses internally for asynchronous, um, the asynchronous stuff is uh, reactor loop which is, if you're, if you're familiar with Node, um, Node uses a reactor loop as well. One big difference is that instead of one reactor loop per process, you get one reactor loop per core. Um, and then when you de uh, deploy an application to Vertex, an instance of that application is referred to as a vertical in, uh, in Vertex parlance. And that vertical gets tied to one of those event loops for the lifetime of the application. So that's, that's, yeah, that's one way you get thread confinement. So that um, vertical is only going to be ever accessed by one thread at a time. And let's talk for a minute about the event bus. So really, I'm setting the stage here so we can actually get into that um, 
uh, example app and, and understand what it's doing a little bit better when we see it. Um, so the, the, the event bus, it lets you pass uh, simple strings of primitives, bytes, byte arrays, uh, and you can also pass structured data around. And Vertex uses JSON as the underlying uh, uh, format for that because it's common among all the languages it supports. They all have uh, support for it. Uh, and so a lot, what the, a lot of the language modules do for you is they, they kind of hide that JSON from you. So if you're using the closure language module, you publish closure data to it, it's converted to JSON underneath. If you read data off the event bus, it comes back to you as closure data. Uh, but you still have to be aware that's happening because JSON's obviously a lower fidelity um, uh, format than, than, than closure. Uh, it supports publish subscribe semantics, so you can publish a message and then every person that's listening to it or every um, Everything that's listening to it will get, get a copy of it. Uh, it supports point to point, so you can publish a message and um, only one of those receivers will, will get it. And then it supports request response. So you can send a message, uh, one receiver will get it, can reply to your message, you can reply to the reply ad infinitum, basically have a private conversation between two components. And it's clusterable, so it uses uh, Hazelcast for discovery, so, these, so the, the multiple JVMs can discover each other, and then it makes a direct connection between them all and builds a, a, a topology. Um, and that Hazelcast piece is, cluster, is sorry, it's pluggable, so if you want to use some other technology, you can. And, the, and one of the neatest features, I think, is that you can also uh, bridge that event bus down to a browser client. And when you do that, the browser client just becomes another component in your application, and so it's almost a peer to any other node. Uh, the messages are transient, so that means there, there's no durability. So if, uh, if you're in a cluster and a net, the network goes down or a node goes down, you potentially lose messages. Um, and so if durability is important to you, then, then you may not want to use the event bus for those types of messages. But the, really the, the event bus is designed to be a simple RPC mechanism, and I think that's why it's, it's transient. Um, so let's, let's talk about our sample app. Uh, it's a stream processing app. Unfortunately, we're not going to be processing a stream of cheese. That would be pretty awesome. But we're going we're to process uh, a, a stream of words. Uh, so we're going to have, have a stream of words. We're going to have a browser-based UI where you can register um, regular expression filters against that stream and basically split it into substreams. So I'm going to switch to some code. So the, the application itself, it's, it's polyglot. So we've got four languages in there. We've got uh, Clojure, ClojureScript, JavaScript, and Ruby. Uh, and, let, we're gonna, and, and, and this is, this is basically uh, a Linegan project I'm using to manage this, but I'm using a plugin called Line Vertex, which kind of bridges the, uh, um, the closure world to the Linegan, I mean, to the Vertex world for us. So that we're, I'm going to actually run this thing. All right, so what that's going to do is it's going to start at the Vertex container, and then it's going to deploy our application to it. So, um, before I, I load this, I want to say that I worked really, really hard on the UI for this, and um, so prepare to be blown away. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> so if you're looking, if anybody, if anybody's looking for UI engineer, just see me after. Um, all right, so, so it's pretty basic. We can uh, <clears throat> toggle the raw stream. We see our stream of data. We can add, let's say, anything that contains the letter A. We can add that filter. Let's see anything oops, that starts with a capital letter. Oops, enter doesn't work. OK. Uh, <clears throat> so we can add filters. We can delete filters, delete these substreams. And then we've got a count of, of how, many, um, how many times that, that stream is matched, <clears throat> excuse me, the filter. Um, and it's pretty basic, right? But it, but it gives us the opportunity to talk about some, some interesting features. <coughs> So um, let's see, actually I want to go here. And so as a, here's a diagram kind of showing what we're going to look at. We've got all these different components and they're all going to communicate with each other over the event bus. So they're all decoupled. Um, what we're going to start with is we're going to take a look at this data source piece first. And that is uh, written in Ruby because this is a polyglot application. So my, my source of words is basically the words dictionary off my local machine. Obviously in a real application it might be slightly more interesting like cheese. Um, the, uh, the, the, the first Vertex feature we are using here, why can't I type, there we go, uh, is a timer. So Vertex supports timers. You can do one-shot timers, periodic timers, 
And what we're doing here is we're creating a periodic timer, so every 100 milliseconds, it's gonna take the block we're passing to it, convert that to a runnable, and just throw it onto the reactor loop. And so it'll bubble up and, and get executed. In the body of this thing, we're actually publishing to the event bus. <clears throat> So the event bus, um, it, it, it's fairly simple, and it's also um, a low ceremony. So if you're used to using, a, if you've used like a JMS system before, in, inter, in order to interact to either publish or receive, you have to have a destination object. And, that, and so you have to actually ask the message broker to create you a destination, which can, in some systems, be a heavyweight operation, relatively. Um, with Vertex, uh, instead of destinations, you have addresses. And an address is just a string, just something that names it. And so, um, in this case, our address is coming from some configuration, and we'll see how that gets here in a bit. But, um, so when you, when you try to publish to an, an address that does not exist, now it does. If you try to receive from one that doesn't exist, it comes into existence. So we're just publishing every 10 times a second, we're publishing uh, a random word from our data set. So, so that's how we get our data source. Now let's go look at the filter and how, see how the filter interacts with that data source and the rest of the system. So finally, some closure code. Um, so here we're, we're using an, the event bus namespace, which comes from the closure language module. Kind of wraps uh, the Java, Java-ness of the event bus. The interesting pieces start here. Um, <clears throat> we're actually we're calling this onMessage function, which lets us register a function to be called anytime a message comes in. It's a callback. So uh, registering on this command address. So since, since things are decoupled, uh, the filter has no idea where its commands come from. It just knows they come in on the command address and I, and I do things with them. So the commands that are coming in here are um, add filter and delete filter, um, which is what correspond directly to the add filter and delete buttons in the UI. And so add filter we, itself just registers uh, another message uh, handler against the stream address, which is the address that the, the Ruby data source is publishing to. And all it does is just call this match filter function, which applies that regular expression, and then publishes to yet another address, the result address, which the browser will listen to to display the substreams when a match occurs. So that's the filter piece, this guy. Let's jump all the way over and see what that, that client looks like. Um, I'm making a lot of noise, aren't I? Let's see if that is better. Um, let's see, client. So this is closure script. So I mentioned that you, could, you can bridge um, the event bus down to browser clients and basically make them just another component on the event bus. To, to support that, Vertex ships a, uh, a JavaScript client that who's a, the API of that, you know, is very similar to the JavaScript server side API you use for interacting with the event bus. Uh, so the closure language module ships a closure script wrapper around that thing, so you have that same parity between client and server. And that's what we're using here. Um, uh, and that, so that, that's, that's what we're bringing in there. The rest of the, the, the we're also using, a, using doing a lot of uh, in focus DOM transformations in here. We're not going to look at those. What we really care about is the um, see, these guys. So so again, this looks very similar to, we, to what we saw before. We're registering. Uh, callbacks against addresses. So the result address is the address that the filter namespace is publishing to. Stats address is where our counts come from, and we'll see where those are generated momentarily. And um, the other interesting piece here is uh, send command. Yeah. Where this is, and this, so this is what actually sends those commands to the command address, the add and delete filter. And again, the client has no idea who's consuming these messages, who's generating the messages it's displaying. It just um, knows about the event bus. So we've seen, let's see, the data source, the filter, the client. Let's look at this web piece that kind of ties the two together. We're going to step away from closure and go to JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> first thing we do here is we actually create, have to create an HTTP server. So even though we're running inside a Vertex container, that container provides minimal services. The primary service you get there is deployment of things and the event bus. So we have to actually create our own server as if we are embedded in a way. So we create that server, uh, provided a, a function that's going to get past every request that comes in. <clears throat> and that, that's pretty straightforward. It's just serving up static assets off the disk, our HTML, our CSS, our JavaScript. The neat piece here is starts here. 
Um, we're taking that HTTP server and we're wrapping it inside a SOCJS server. SOCJS is a, a protocol for doing bidirectional browser communication that will tr attempt web sockets and then fall back to other, um, other technologies until it finds something that works for the browser network combo that the client presents. And this is what we're actually using to bridge that, uh, the event bus. So that doesn't happen by default. You have to explicitly say, I want to share my event bus with my clients. And that happens through this bridge call. So the first thing we pass it is some configuration, which here includes basically the context path where it can be found. Uh, and then we've got the, the other two pieces are security. So that first array we're passing in there is, um, controls what the client can send to the server. So we're basically saying the client can only send messages on the command address. And then the, the second array is what, what addresses the uh, client can register handlers on to listen, to receive data on. And um, you can get more complicated than this. You can actually um, filter on the shape of the message that passes through, pass through this thing. Um, <clears throat> but I'm mentioning this because I think the security piece here is critical if you're going to use this thing in production. You want to be very careful that you've got this configured properly. Because otherwise, if you have a bunch of uh, addresses you're using internally inside your application, it's possible to expose those to clients, which may not be the best thing. Um, and then we uh, listen on a port. So now we have the web piece. So we've seen data source, the filter, uh, the client, the web piece that ties them together. Let's take a look at uh, where our count comes from. So that's over here in a namespace called stats. So here we're using a little more functionality of Vertex. We're actually uh, bringing in Vertex Core, and we're going to use that here to deploy a module. So we're storing our, our stats in Redis, and we need a way to talk to Redis. So we're going to bring in uh, uh, the Redis module for Vertex. And what's going to happen is we're going to call deploy module with this um, Vertex specific module specifier. It's going to say, well, I don't have Redis installed. I'm going to go grab it from, or mod Redis. I'm going to go grab it from Maven, unpack it, and, and install it. And then when it deploys that, that module is actually going to create a, uh, a vertical and deploy that vertical. That vertical is then going to listen on a known uh, event bus address. And so, yeah, I mentioned before that the languages were implemented as modules. But modules don't have to be language implementations. They can be anything, any kind of functionality that you want to use in Vertex. The, um, in fact, the recommended way to go to production is to take your verticals, wrap them up in a module, and deploy the module. Um, yeah, so, so we've got that. So we've got the, the Redis module listening on a, a known address. Now we have to interact with it. And this is where things get a little ugly. Uh, um, uh, this is what we uh, affectionately refer to as callback hell, right? And um, it's the common complaint about callback-based, one common complaint about callback-based uh, asynchronous programming. And I'm not going to go through this because um, I don't want to. Uh, but the, uh, um, uh, the, real, the real problem with callback hell, right, you end up with a bunch of nested callbacks, and you get in a situation where it's difficult to discern the intent of the code difficult to, to follow the flow of control. For, but for simple cases like this, we can do what we, we would normally do as good closure developers and take and break this up into to small, well-named functions. Uh, and then it comes, you know, slightly easier to reason about. Oops. Let's get about there. Um, so this code does the exact same thing as the, the obfuscated code above. Deploy a module. Then we can talk about it a little more easily. So we've got a we register a handler against the result address. That's the same address that the filter namespace is publishing to. Uh, and then we're passing each one of those to this update match count function. Update match count is what actually interacts with Redis for us. So it sends this, this increment command to Redis, which is a, an atomic get and increment if you're not familiar with Redis. Uh, and since we're doing this asynchronously, well, we want to know the result, but since we're asynchronous, we have to register a reply handler, which will get re called when, for, when Redis responds. So that's this handle Redis response. Clever name. Um, uh, I can't tell you. There we go. Uh, so we check the status of that message, and then if it's, if it's successful, we're going to publish to the stats address, which is what our browser listens on to get those counts. Um, otherwise, we throw an exception. So. Um, th I think, I think you know, breaking it up like this makes it easier to talk about, and it works for simple cases like this. But there's this new thing, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, in the closure community called Core Async, right? Wh at, which uh, takes a totally different approach to, to asynchronous programming. 
it's a different asynchronous model. Um, and so I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could combine these two somehow, combine some of those concepts with Vertex? So that led me to write this thing. Um, so here we're bringing in a different, we're bringing in this event bus implementation that is, is uh, not callback based. It operates on channels instead. This code does the same thing as we've seen twice now. We deploy the module, but then instead of registering a callback against the result address, we actually just request a message channel. That message channel will just get a message every time something uh, appears there on that, on that address. Then we drop into a go loop here, which is basically uh, just a loop inside of a go block, or a go inside of a loop, no, other way. Uh, and, and, uh, and so, and then we just grab, we just take messages from those results and pass them along um, through a thread that looks very familiar. It's easier to understand, and if, and if we suddenly, so if this became a more complicated operation instead of more nested callbacks, we would just end up with more things in our thread. An update match count is also operating with channels. It's doing a send with a reply chan to, to interact with Redis. That's pretty cool. There's bad news, though. None of this exists. Um, <laughs> So well, I should, I, let, me, let me say it this way. I, I have enough implemented to make this work, but I'm not convinced yet it's a great idea to try to marry these two models. Uh, so I have not, uh, I don't know how performant it will be and what, what, what the broader implications are. So I haven't taken this idea and spread it across a full event bus or a full Vertex API implementation. But it's something I'm, I'm you know, thinking about. Um, we'll see if, it, if, if we actually get anywhere with that. Um, so that's, so what we just saw was basically the counter piece and the Redis piece. We saw both of those there. Um, there's two more pieces, two more things I want to show you before we leave the code. Yeah, so that's one's initialization. So when I deploy this application to Vertex, it has to be initialized somehow. And, and there's, ver there's configuration in the project CLJ, which tells the Vertex plugin to tell Vertex to run this function. It's just going to initialize our filter namespace, space, and this initialize the stats namespace. And then this is where we deploy our Ruby and JavaScript code. So we're actually calling this, making this deploy vertical call, which will load that Ruby uh, code um, and then pass it along to the Ruby interpreter, and then we've got a Ruby vertical. We're passing along the config there. That config is basically just this. It's a map that just gives us well-known keys, uh, mapping them to uh, address names. Uh, and then, and then we're, you know, we're doing the same for the web vertical. So you know, I said that when you deploy a vertical, it uh, gets tied to one reactor loop for the lifetime of the application. So what if you have eight cores? You have eight reactor loops. If you deploy one vertical, you're taking advantage of how many cores? One, right? So you're ignoring seven cores. So you can actually, we have that instances keyword argument there at the end um, where you can actually say, well, I want multiple instances of this thing, and they will, they will be put on different reactor loops. So it gives you a little uh, more efficiency there. And then we start a REPL. It's an NREPL endpoint. And so you can attach to that and do um, interactive development in the way you've grown accustomed to. So um, we're not going to look at the REPL now because we've kind of all seen that before. So that, that's the code. Um, let's go back here. And we'll beat this horse a little more. We've got, um, uh, so this is the diagram again, but it's kind of fleshed out with you know, what some of the languages we're seeing here and a little more of the technology. Um, I think the takeaways from this are, uh, there's a couple of things. One is that, that we've got these pieces written in different languages, but we don't care what language they're written in. We're all running in the same JVM here now, uh, and we're all, they're all talking over the event bus and don't care uh, that one piece is Clojure, one piece is Ruby. In fact, we have no idea what the Redis plugin's written in. I suspect Java, but I haven't looked at it. Um, Another, another piece here is that uh, we're running in one JVM now. We could take the same application and build a Vertex cluster, deploy it across the cluster, uh, and it would work exactly the same with zero changes to the application code. I think that's kind of cool. And then, and then we've got our bridge, so we're actually bringing in those browser clients as peers in that cluster. I think that's a really powerful idea, that everything is just a component. So we talked, we, uh, we've looked at some of these features. Um, we've seen the HTTP server. We saw, we've, I've talked the event bus to death. 
Uh, we've seen timers, and there's, but there's a few other things that su supports, like um, TCP, UDP, WebSocket, async servers, <coughs> clients for all those things, as well as uh, an asynchronous DNS client. And then it has asynchronous file system support, so you can do asynchronous reads, writes, creates. Um, and we've been using Vertex here in, in, uh, as a container, but you can actually uh, embed that inside another, another JVM process. And so um, uh, there's a, a blog post on the Immutant um, website where we take an embedded Vertex and use it to bridge the JMS-based messaging system in Immutant uh, across the event bus down to the browser. Um, so if you're interested in embedding, that might be worth looking at. Let's see. So, so let's talk about trade-offs. Um, some of the good things, I, I've, I've touched on all these, high genetic complexity, et cetera. Um, but what, what do we lose to get those? Well, we're hiding genetic complexity. Um, and that was, that was my, you know, uh, the first point on my last slide, but, but I think there's, there's value in hiding some of that complexity, but there are times where you need to get down to those knobs. You need to be able to write your own channel handlers to do things. And with Vertex, you currently, all the, all the netty is hidden from you currently. Um, there, there can be some, some uh, language ecosystem friction. So, so if you say you're using uh, Ruby and you want to use Ruby gems, um, since Vertex kind of has its own idea about how dependencies are handled, because it has to support all these languages, it doesn't pick the dependency mechanism for any one of them. So there, there can be some friction uh, to, to tie the, the language's um, normal dependency mechanism to Vertex. And for a closure, uh, the Line Vertex plugin um, helps with that. It basically will take, when you start up a Vertex, it'll take the dependency list in your project CLJ and convert that to a format that uh, Vertex expects. We've talked about callback hell um, and ways around that. And, and one thing I'm, I'm meant to mention on that the, the slide when I was talking about that is that uh, another way to deal with this is using something like RxJava. I think that's what a lot of people in the Vertex community, especially people doing Java, will use RxJava for this type of thing. And I think uh, RxJava is neat, um, but I, I'm more excited, at least for closure, about the possibilities of using, possibilities of using core async there. But I, I think that needs more thought, more more experimentation to see if that's actually going to work. Um, and then uh, a common complaint uh, with reactor-based systems is don't block the reactor loop. Bad things happen when you block, block reactor loops. But, um, and unfortunately, I think the, 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 that idea is a leaky abstraction. That's something that we shouldn't have to worry about, but we do. Um, and so it's something you certainly have to be aware of when you're using Vertex. And there are times, too, when, when you actually, you can't do th everything asynchronously. So say you're talking to a database that has no asynchronous support. It's only synchronous. So Vertex has a, has a, uh, a solution for that as well. They're called worker verticals. So you can take a vertical, and instead of that, and you can say, hey, I'm deploying not a regular vertical, but a worker. And when that gets deployed, instead of being attached to an event or a reactor loop, um, it gets tied to a thread pool. So it can, it can then block. And it communicates with the rest of your system like everything else, just over the event bus. But Vertex still guarantees that that vertical is only going to be called by one thread at a time. So you still have that thread confinement and thread safety if, that's, if you're using a language where that's a concern. Um, and, and you can, if you're, if you're certain that that, um, that, that, that that vertical is thread safe, you can actually mark it as such. And then it will get a little more efficiency and use multiple threads at the same time against it. So we'll talk about some other projects in the uh, Vertex ecosystem that may be of interest. One is the, the Ring Vertex adapter. And to quote Rich, it's what it sounds like. Um, it lets you bring, it kind of helps ease that ecosystem friction a little bit. You can bring Ring apps over and run them on top of Vertex. I haven't actually used it, but uh, my understanding is that it, it works mostly. Uh, Noden is a, um, uh, it's basically if, uh, a Node.js compatibility layer. So the Vertex API is quite different than Nodes, but this is a project that aims to let you bring a Node.js app and run it directly on top of Vertex. Um, and I don't know what its status is currently, but um, it's promising, I think. Uh, and then Yoke. So since, since this is all, since this is kind of a new platform and different than, than most others, um, Yoke, is, Yoke aims to be uh, kind of a web application framework. Um, 
uh, for it that supports multiple languages now. There's no closure bindings yet for Yoke, but there's uh, Java, Groovy, and some other language I don't care about. But, um, uh, but yeah, I think that's interesting. It wouldn't be difficult to write uh, closure bindings for that. Uh, and so some resources, you know, Vertex website, uh, the closure language module. So uh, since the closure language module is not yet 1.0 and Vertex core doesn't reference it, you have to, if you install Vertex, you have to modify a configuration file to tell it about closure. It's pretty easy. Uh, and then the line Vertex plugins there and the code for this talk uh, will be there eventually, probably today. Um, and I want, I want to close on this thought. Um, this is a stated goal uh, of the Vertex project, and it's kind of like throwing a bone to us in the Clojure community, because this is a big deal for us too. But I think Vertex does a good job of this. It's simple uh, while still being powerful. And I think, you know, that's a, it's a, 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 a thin line to walk to try to, to try to, to do that. And I think they do a pretty good job. And I think that um, it's going to get better going forward. I think they'll continue to do this, because it's a fairly young project now. Um, and that is all I have. So if you have any questions, I have uh, some time. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Yeah. High availability. Yeah, so he's asking about uh, f failure modes on the, on the event bus and high availability. Is that right? So it's, um, um, so I know the event bus has, uh, you, you can, there are now facilities in the latest version where you can actually set timeouts. Like you can say, well, I've sent a message. Because you see, because since it's, you, since you have no idea whether there's something on the other end actually listening to your messages, right? So, um, you can now say that you can set a timeout and say, well, I care if this message is never received. So you can set a timeout and at least handle that case for, for more critical messages. Um, and you mentioned high availability. Uh, so, that, that, um, so if you're running in a cluster, you can actually do, it actually supports high availability where you can deploy uh, a, a vertical to multiple vertex instances, but it only, and you can mark it as, as a, a singleton, basically. So it'll come up on one. And then if that node dies, it'll automatically appear on another, another node. So. Yes, sir? Uh, if the two nodes cannot talk to each other, uh, you mean they, can't, they, they, like they lose the connection to each other, or they can never talk to each other? Um, uh, in the case of, so yeah, if they were part of a high, high availability setup, it's pretty simple. So what would happen is if they lost connection, then they would both be running the same thing. It would start up on the, the, uh, the other guy, I think. I haven't played with the, high the, the, uh, the HA stuff yet. It's fairly new, so I'm not sure exactly. Anything else? Am I missing anyone? Okay. Great. Thank you.